Okay, so we'll get started. Goati kai tawa haupa tu shinome kutu tuitza kohayahano e shrashka washti. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bianca Mitchell. I am from the Pueblo of Akama, and I am Ayanta's education manager. I will be serving as today's webinar moderator, and I will also be managing the question and answers at the end of the presentation. Again, thank you for joining us for the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association's webinar series. Today's educational webinar is Cultural Centers, Planning for Tourism. For those of you who are not familiar with IANTA, for nearly two decades, IANTA has served as the national voice for American Indian nations engaged in cultural tourism. In addition to serving as the voice for Indian country tourism, IANTA provides technical assistance and training to tribal nations and native owned enterprises engaged in tourism, hospitality, and recreation. IANTA's mission is to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. IANTA's educational offerings include the Goal International Virtual Conference, which will be held on April 21st and 22nd of this year. The Go International is designed to help tribal tourism businesses keep up with the rapid shifts in the package travel landscape. Go International features expert speakers and hands-on presentations that will guide tribal enterprises and businesses in conceptualizing and developing their tourism products and promoting them to tour operators, wholesalers, and domestic and international group travelers. You can register today at our ianta.org uh, website at Go International. IANTA also provides educational opportunities for tribes through our American Annual American Indian Tourism Conference, or AITC. The 2021 AITC event will be held in Fort McDowell, Arizona at the Wicopa Casino Resort on October 25th through the 28th of this year. Please visit our website for more information at ianta.org to learn more about our educational programming and um, for the information on registration for our AITC. Again, thank you for joining us this morning for today's webinar, Cultural Centers Planning for Tourism. You will hear from three Native women leaders in cultural tourism this morning. Two guide major cultural centers and the third is working on opening a new center. You will learn how they share the art, culture and voices of their tribes and how they are planning for tourism during and post pandemic. You will hear from Kaneganak Agak, which who's Emily Edenshaw, that's her traditional name. I'm sorry, Emily, if I didn't say it right. <laughs> um, she is the president and CEO of the Alaska Native Heritage Center and how she helped lead cultural tourism efforts across Alaska with the end goal of advancing awareness of the entire Alaska Native community. Also presenting in this webinar is Undersecretary Valerie Walters with the Department of Cultural and Humanities from the Chickasaw Nation. She will share their efforts to elevate Chickasaw history, their museums, and their language by promoting and sharing the strong and unique culture of the Chickasaw people. Lastly, Kay Anderson, Director of Public Relations for the Agua Caliente Band of Cujia, Indians will discuss how she leads the team responsible for developing communication, educational and outreach programs to advance community knowledge and understanding of the Agua Caliente Band of Cujia Indians and its efforts. Before I introduce Emily, I'm gonna go ahead and share some poll questions. As you know, um, we here at IANTA like to um, do poll questions. So I'm gonna launch that right now. You can take a look at the screen. And we want to know where, uh, what region you represent. Um, do you have a native cultural center or museum? And are you working on developing a cultural center or mu museum? And in 2021, do you expect tourism revenues to increase, decrease, stay the same? What is your top two concerns? Infrastructure issues, stable funding, staffing, recruitment, retention, um, pay expectations, marketing. And then the last question, what is your favorite things to see, do when visiting a native cultural center? I'll give you a few more seconds to answer. And looks like the answers are coming through. 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and then I will share the results with you. Okay, so it looks like we've got a lot of individuals from the Southwest region. 61% um, have a Native Cultural Center and 66% um, are working on or developing a cultural center or museum. And then 76% um, expect tourism revenues to increase in 2021. And then about 47% is um, concerns our staffing. And what is your favorite things to see and do at a, a Native Cultural Center? 63% ties with educational historical displays and workshops, demonstrations from Native artisans. And coming in at 68% is cultural workshops and seminars. Thank you all for answering those questions for us. And at this time, sorry, I would like to introduce Emily. Again, she is the president and CEO of the Alaska Native Heritage Center with roots to Emmonic, Alaska. Emily is the president and CEO of the Alaska Native Heritage Center, a renowned statewide living cultural center located in Anchorage, Alaska. For the last several years, Emily has led cultural tourism efforts across Alaska with the end goal of advancing the entire Alaska Native community. In 2020, Emily was named Vice President of the Alaska Travel Industry Association, ATIA, Arts, Cultural and Heritage Statewide Chapter Board, elected to the ATIA Board of Directors, elected to the Alaska Humanities Forum Board of Directors, and appointed to the Anchorage Public Safety Commission. Um, her epic name, again, Kanaganak Kan Agag, <laughs> means a person with a beautiful persona, spirit, aura, and friend. Emily and her husband, Devin, have three beautiful sons and two adventurous daughters. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Emily. Welcome, Emily, and thank you for being a part of our webinar series today. Brianna, thank you. Let me make sure I have control of the screen. Can, all right. All right, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Edenshaw. I am Yupik and Anupiak. My family is from Imanic, Alaska. My grandparents are John and Cecilia Zippery, and my great grandparents are Pearly and Axel Johnson. I live and work on the Denina lands as the president and CEO of the Alaska Native Heritage Center. I want to say thank you to Ayanta for having me, and I want to say Goyana to our um, guests who are here today and help. Hello to the three people from Alaska that I saw on the, uh, on the poll, um, but I'm really honored to be here today and excited to talk to you about the work that we've done here at the Heritage Center. Make sure. Okay, so here I am. Uh, <laughs> a little bit about me outside of work and uh, my service commitments. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student. I'm studying in, in it, I'm studying Indigenous Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I, as, as shared in my bio, I serve on, se on several different boards and committees. There's my email if you'd like it and my contact information. So if you've never been to Alaska, first I wanna just say, please come. Um, we are open for business. Um, but the Heritage Center, a little bit about us, um, we were really born with a community vision to be a healing center for our people. Uh, you really can't tell the, the history of the Alaska Native Heritage Center without talking about AFN. Uh, and the main point is our community came together and said we really needed a place in Anchorage that really celebrated and represents all regions and all cultures. And that's really important to know because Alaska is really, really big. And when you go to various regions, there are cultural centers there. But here in Anchorage, we often refer to this place as the biggest village. And so in, in 1989, we had a convening and really out of that came the vision to create a cultural center. 
One thing a lot of people don't know is that when they had this vision of a healing center in Anchorage, there were two components to it. One being they wanted to have a prime location and the second being that they wanted a, a, a $10 million endowment. The, the first point, um, and this is, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, is that uh, when we were trying to have our prime location in the middle of Anchorage, Midtown, Anchorage voters at the time said, no, we don't want natives in our backyard. So where we are located today um, is very intentional. And again, you really can't talk about our history without talking about the racism and our experience with racism in Alaska. Um, we're still working on our $10 million endowment, but um, I wanted to share that with everyone because a lot of the work that we do today not only is grounded in healing and and is grounded in community building, but it's also addressing the ongoing effects um, of systemic racism. So our vision is thriving Alaska Native people and cultures are respected and valued. And as I shared, we're the only cultural center in Alaska that represents all regions and all cultures. So what we do in a nutshell, uh, we do cultural awareness workshops, school visits, Alaska Native youth development, uh, Paul located up on the upper right hand side. He's been with us since the opening um, of the Heritage Center. And um, for our visitors on the line, when I say cultural awareness workshops, this is really geared towards our non-native partners and relatives that really want to learn more about who we are and where we come from. And it's a time where you get to work with Paul or with some of our culture bearers or elders where we come to you um, either in person or, or over Zoom and we really talk about Alaska Native history and we talk about cultural communications. We've hosted cultural awareness workshops with educators, with professionals, uh, with NASA. Um, but again, it's really grounded in the mission and vision to, pr to provide a safe space for our attendees to ask questions. Um, and this is important to know because if you went, if you went to and through the same education system, uh, the education system that I went through, you don't graduate with the type of education or knowledge of Alaska Native history. And so it really is that time for us to spend one on one. Um, pictured on the lower right hand side are our youth interns. And so that speaks to our Alaska Native youth development. Um, we do have summer and winter internship programs. I'm also really proud to share with everyone that this last year we um, we implemented our first indigenous fellows, um, our first indigenous fellowship program. In terms of our community wellness work, this is really grounded in our healing work. Uh, we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of work around suicide prevention. We partner with our universities here in Anchorage. Uh, and we also do a lot of master artist workshops. Um, and this is something that I'm really proud to share. We recently received uh, a Mellon grant, uh, which I'm gonna be talking about in a couple slides. So in a really broad brush stroke, and this is something that for years, even before I, I joined the Heritage Center, I think um, the Heritage Center has just been kind of distilled down to, it's just a cultural center, that it's just a tourism place, you know, just here for the tour, you know, for tourists in the summer. And that was one, that was actually a piece of feedback that I heard before I accepted this position from, um, from a sister of mine in the community. And, you know, the work that we do here is way more than just cultural tourism. And I'm sure people who are on the line here from Alaska, when we talk about cultural tourism in Alaska, it is really a sleeping giant. Uh, mainly because when you, when you talk about it in the lower 48, in my opinion, what I've seen is that it's a little bit more accepted and understood about what the role of cultural tourism is. Um, throughout Indian country and in Alaska, we really are in an exciting time and the work that we're doing in partnership here in Alaska that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about later. But again, in a really broad brushstroke, it's really what we've been um, kind of described as, you know, we're only here for tourists, um, you know, we're only open during the summer. Yes, we work with over a million people um, and we do have thousands of people who come to our center every summer, but really the heart of who we are and what we do is for our people. 
So impacts of COVID. Um, I would like to share. So when I accepted my position, I started in December and then COVID hit in March. And I would like to say that, you know, I prepared for this position, but, you know, a global pandemic was not part of that. <laughs> um, but all joking aside, you know, I really do feel grateful to be where I'm at today. Um, you know, being able to work here at a center, a healing center, a cultural center, um, you know, like every other person on the line here, you know, we were not immune from this global pandemic. We were heavily impacted. We lost over a million dollars in tourism revenues. Uh, we lost facility sales. Um, we had a 96% uh, visitor reduction rate. Um, so at least we had 4%, but still we had a huge impact in terms of uh, visitors. Uh, we did have to lay off employees and we had to curtail programming. So in, in terms of our response, this is something I really want to commend my team here and, and our board. Almost immediately, you know, we started, you know, meeting internally, trying to figure out, you know, how can we get ahead of this? How can we get it, you know, in front of this? And I'm sure many of, of you on the line, it, it felt so much, you know, we were trying to learn how to fly the plane as we were building it. And I'm sure many of you have heard that, that, um, that analogy, but for us here at the Heritage Center, um, one of the things that really paid off, uh, I would say, is our, uh, our response in terms of bringing together the entire team. And so not only did we bring together our staff, we brought together our interns, we brought together our board, we brought together our elders, and we did host an intergenerational strategic planning process. Uh, we do currently have a strategic plan, and what we wanted to do is, you know, knowing that we were all going through this together, we wanted to make sure that we had everybody in the room. And it was during that strategic planning process where our youth interns, you know, on one hand, I was blown away with what they said, but then on the other hand, I really shouldn't be, or I shouldn't have been blown away with what they said because our youth, they're remarkable, right? Um, but it was really that that moment that I look back and it was a very defining moment for us here at the Heritage Center. Not only out of that meeting did we all commit to, we are going to A, manage to open safely. Uh, and the main reason for that is that going back to our initial uh, vision for by our community, for our community, is that we are a healing center. And if we are going through a pandemic, we need to safely find a way to open so our community can be in a place of healing and to come here and to, you know, walk our campus. So the guiding motivation for us is we are going to manage to open. And the second is we are really going to come out of this stronger before. We all kept on saying that no matter what happens, we will learn from this. We will come out of this stronger than before. So uh, as I shared, we immediately, you know, we hosted board meetings, staff meetings. Um, we implemented our mitigation plan. And we started, you know, working around the clock, applying for COVID funding. Uh, you know, at the time we didn't we didn't have the software where where we can um, um, kind of forecast the like the impact. So it was taking you know you know hours just to say you know if we had you know a fifty you know a fifty percent visitor reduction versus ten percent. And so it was you know right when we would go through. Um, you know, one kind of model, you know, it would completely change. And so um, I really, again, want to commend my team that during that time, we were constantly, like I said, trying to understand and figure out what we were dealing with. Uh, we did uh, secure 39 out of the 45 grants that we went after. Um, but really, we use this time to also build relationship with partners. We signed strategic MOUs with native and non-native entities. Uh, and we also started hosting statewide cultural tourism planning calls. And this is something I really wanna say, Guyana to Ianta, our statewide cultural tourism working group was born out of the Alaska breakout session several years ago at Ianta. And I'm really proud to share that we've been meeting quarterly and I'm really excited to share the progress here in a couple of slides. Uh, and as shared here, uh, I did run for state and, and national tourism boards, 
And really the main reason behind that is that we need to be informed. I also encourage my staff, take advantage of any sort of training. If now, if there's any time to go after, you know, any sort of training, any sort of type of higher education, now is the time. And I really want to say thank you to Ayanta because we have two of our staff here going through the certificate program. Uh, this was also a time where we partnered with other statewide organizations uh, to advance uh, work such as our MMIWG work. Um, we also hosted the Lady Justice Task Force here. And picture to the right is uh, Leon Kinevac, who is with the Alaska Art Alliance. So the Alaska Art Alliance is a project, it's a grassroots organization uh, that's led by Leon. And it he created this social enterprise that uses arts and culture to help 20 Alaska Native men stay off the street so they're not homeless. And many of, and many of the men struggle with addiction. And because of um, you know, his social enterprise was so new, he didn't qualify or the, the entity didn't qualify for a lot of the COVID funding that was coming out. So what we did is we signed a contract or a strategic MOU with him and we started supporting uh, the artists and the carvers uh, so they wouldn't get shut down because a lot of their revenues also depended on tourists. So I'm really proud to share that we did receive a Mellon Foundation grant and the Alaska Art Alliance is really growing and thriving right now. And um, if, if I might share, you know, I think the best part of my week is uh, receiving weekly updates from Leon. Uh, it really is transformative in the sense that, um, you know, just last week we were able to help one guy get off the street and, and into an apartment. And so it, it really is this, um, this testament that arts and culture, when you ground it in our way of life and our way of knowing, it could really be healing. We also use this time to strengthen our, our infrastructure here. Uh, we did facility upgrades and technology enhancements, uh, which really allowed us to do school visits. And so this really is grounded in the end of the, in the, it's grounded in the understanding that before COVID, the only way to experience the Heritage Center is you would have to come to the Heritage Center. And so I don't know how many people on the call that was your, your reality, but that was our reality. And so what we did is said, okay, we're gonna bring the Heritage Center to people. If people can't come to us, we're gonna come to you. We also use this time to really enhance our summer internship program. Um, one thing I wanna note here is that it, you know, during this, um, during our intergenerational strategic planning process, the feedback that we got from our interns, uh, it was really, um, it was medicine that we needed at the time. Some, some, if not all of our interns said that, um, you know, the feedback from our community, we're just here for our tourists, you know, we're, you know, we're a tourist organization, that feedback came from our interns as well. And it was a really heartbreaking moment for me because that is not what we wanted to hear. And so um, the feedback that we got from them was they felt like they came second to our tourists. And it was in that moment where we all just kind of had this, you know, this reality check of why are we here? You know, yes, we're a cultural tourism or a, a cultural tourism organization, but are we here just for tourists? No, we're not. We're here for our community. And what COVID has really allowed us to do is really get back to our mission and vision of being a healing center, of being here for our community and our interns and our youth and our elders. And so what we've done this last year is we've really strengthened our internship program, brought in master artists every week. Um, if you go to our social media pages, our, our entire social media is, is intern run. Um, and I really want to just commend our interns because that was really hard for them to tell us, you know, their honest feedback, but it was the feedback that we needed here at the time. So in terms of our approach, um, you know, really is, uh, we're, our number one reason why we're here, we are here for our community. We're here for education. Um, we are also here in, you know, we are here with a mission and vision and the dedication to say that, you know what, we're going to bring the Heritage Center to you if you can't come to us. And as I shared earlier, we know that culture is our, is our strongest form of medicine. And really at the end of the day, everyone, no matter where you are, you should have access to your culture. And this is something that I often hear that, oh, you just serve our community in schools. You just serve our youth. No, we serve people who are on the streets. 
We serve people who are in jails. We serve people who are in shelters. We serve people who are in um, our school system. If you're part of the Alaska Native community, we serve you. And that's something that we wanted to say um, here at the Heritage Center, but also uphold. The one thing I wanna briefly touch on is COVID also allowed us an opportunity to uh, kind of uh, consolidate programs, meaning communications is development, development is communications. And so now um, that's just one department versus two or three different departments. So these are just some examples of our um, methods. I invite you to go to our, our website. Um, we've done infographics. We do, um, so our website is www.alaskanative.net. Um, we have how-to videos on there. Um, and many of them, and you'll see, they're all, they're all led by our youth interns. And that was one of the other pieces of feedback that they shared. So here's our social media outreach. Um, you know, this is one thing that, you know, our two youth interns, uh, we were able to bring our dance group to our elders, um, to the elders uh, home here in, uh, in Anchorage. And we did a, a, a live Facebook feed. Again, this is really grounded in the understanding that if you can't come to us, we're gonna come to you. Another example of that is our culture boxes. And this idea was, uh, you know, again, we're not gonna charge for it. Everyone should have, have access to their culture no matter where they live. Um, when we first decided to kind of tip our toe uh, in, uh, in the culture box uh, pool of water, we thought, you know, maybe 200 people might apply within the first launch of them. We had over 2,000 uh, people sign up for our boxes. Uh, we've delivered boxes to almost every region in the state. We've sent boxes across the country. Um, in addition to our culture boxes, another example of us bringing the Heritage Center to you is through our our video brochures and this is something that I should have put a video on here so you could see them but it was real it's a neat way um, if you just google video brochures we were able to use one of our videos and we sent them out to set to more than 75 funders and saying you know thank you for your partnership thank you for your support through these last several years and it really is like I said grounded in that that idea of we're going to come to you versus you having to come to us we also, during this time, a lot of our artists um, provided feedback that, you know, they, you know, they, like all of us, they, you know, they were trying to understand and figure out the pandemic and, you know, having to try to teach online classes and do and, and work with technology. So what we did is we created branding kits um, with um, cameras with head straps, with um, with ring lights, um, with displays, anything that you can think of. I mean, even gloves to hold the items. Um, so our artists, if they want to sell their items out, um, either on their website or on Facebook, on Instagram, they'll have this kit that is really grounded in capacity building. Uh, I'm also really proud to share that last year, one of uh, one of the exciting announcements is that the Alaska Native Heritage Center was picked as one of 20 cultural treasures by the Ford Foundation. And with that, it did uh, come with uh, financial support. It's a four year um, uh, partnership with the Ford Foundation and we get to work with other 19 cultural treasures. Uh, I'm very, very excited. I'm also excited to share that I'm going to use this opportunity to really lift up and, you know, leverage cultural tourism as much as I can. Um, you know, one thing that I want to share with everyone, uh, not only has uh, the Cultural Tourism Working Group, um, we've secured funding to create a statewide cultural tourism plan for Alaska, but we're also launching our first cultural tourism economic impact study. And that's really important to know because when you, when you talk about Alaska, there's never been a statewide economic impact study that specifically focuses on cultural tourism. And so that's in the works right now. Um, I'm also, I, I want to give a shout out to Alyssa Rodriguez if she's on the line. She and I have been leading the statewide cultural tourism working group. I also want to really give kudo, kudos to uh, Camille Ferguson and Mario Fulmer and Mary Goddard. You know, they are all trailblazers in Alaska. You know, what we're doing with cultural tourism right now is very, very exciting. Uh, and it's really pivotal. And uh, these are just, and I want to make sure I'm not going over my time, so I'm just going <laughs> to 
breeze through here. Um, so again, we're um, we are opening. So we are opening May 2021. So please, if you decide to come to Alaska, uh, please stop by the Heritage Center. Uh, we are hosting a community smudging event later on uh, this month. If you'd like to sign up, we will uh, mail you your kit. Um, and it's with one of our traditional healers here, Yari Walker. Uh, we are planning safe outdoor events, but again, just grounded in the in the understanding that we are managing to open. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Emily, and congratulations on your Ford Foundation America's Cultural Treasures Award. That's pretty awesome, all the great work you're doing. So next I wanna introduce Valerie Walters. She is the Undersecretary of the Department of Cultural and Humanities of the Chickasaw Nation. Valerie began her career with the Chickasaw Nation in 2002 and currently serves as the Undersecretary. In this role, she assists in elevating Chickasaw history, culture, museums, and language by promoting and sharing the strong and unique culture of the Chickasaw people. She earned her Bachelor Bachelor of Arts degree in Mass Communications with a concentration in Advertising and Public Relations from East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. Valerie currently serves on the Board of Trustees for the Oklahoma Humanities, the Board of Directors for the Oklahoma Museums Association, and the Board of Directors for the Davis, Oklahoma Chamber of Commerce. And Valerie is of Chickasaw and Choctaw descent and is an an enrolled citizen of the Chickas Chickasaw Nation. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, welcome. Sorry for that glitch. Just a moment. We're trying to manage these screens as well. So I want to say thank you so much, Tayenta, for hosting this special presentation. And of course, thank you to the other presenters who are here. My name is Valerie Walters, as Bianca mentioned, and I serve as the Undersecretary for the Department of Culture and Humanities. Now today, I want to talk to you about the Chickasaw Cultural Center. It is a magnificent facility that we are very fortunate to have. But the Chickasaw Nation actually has several museums and historic sites. We have the Chickasaw National Capitol, we have a council house, we have the Chickasaw White House, and then we have some outdoor spaces um, or outdoor facilities, if you will, Fort Washita and Boggy Depot. So the nation in general has a lot of museums and historic sites, but today I wanna to talk about the Chickasaw Cultural Center. So I first want to visit with you about where we began, if you will, our visitors that we've had here. Of course, the pandemic has played a huge role with us as it has with everyone. But I will also want to take you through the campus itself. And I want to talk to you about the different buildings that we have and the meanings that things, the reason that we have things that we do here at the Cultural Center. So to let you know, we opened the Chickasaw Cultural Center July 24th of 2010, and it was an amazing day. We actually had a very special Chickasaw opening prior to that, which was just beautiful to have all of the Chickasaw people who have waited for so long for this facility to come and see this, uh, this amazing place. Now we have had 850,000 visitors from around the world, and as you can see on the PowerPoint, in September of 2019, we had IENTA here. While they were hosting their conference in Oklahoma, they did a day trip to the Chickasaw Cultural Center, really to Chickasaw country. Um, I don't know if it was really us they wanted to see or the chocolate factory. So, but we, we did certainly enjoy having them with us. Um, our facility is a very large tourist destination. But I will say that our facility was actually built to be a home for our Chickasaw people, for our culture, for our history. And it's really just a place where we share all of that with each other. And then, of course, we share that with the world as well. We invite anyone and everyone to come and visit us and share in our history and culture. Now, as a Chickasaw myself, you know, Chickasaw and learning Chickasaw history, culture, traditions. For some of us, that is a lifelong journey, if you will. 
Um, but this facility allows us the opportunity to learn more about ourselves. And that is through every avenue you can imagine from food to research, to reading text, to participating in a demonstration, to learning a cultural craft. It's just a, a very wide span of experiences that you can have here at the Chickasaw Cultural Center for both visitors and Chickasaw citizens. The Chickasaw Cultural Center itself was a very long time in the making, and that's because it is such a special facility. It's one that took over 30 years in the making, and that was through a lot of conversations with Chickasaw citizens, surveys that went out, meetings that were held, to answer the question, what is it that we want to see or have if this is our home for Chickasaw history and culture? Through a lot of that information gathered, and of course with the, the wonderful leadership of Governor Anna Tubby, today is what you see as the home of the Chickasaw history, culture, and traditions. So we do have a lot of interactive programming throughout this facility. And our aim again is to tell our Chickasaw story. Just like everyone else who has a cultural center, working for a cultural center, it's really about us telling our own stories. And I'm, I'm just so excited to see all of these cultural centers that are in process of being built, that have been established and running well, and really focus on who they are and telling their story with the world through their own eyes, through their own ways and traditions. So it's always an amazing thing to see and hear of cultural centers. As the pandemic hit, just like Emily mentioned too, we all switched very quickly, right? We had to in order to continue to connect with our people. So with us, with the Chickasaw Cultural Center and actually with the Chickasaw Department of Culture and Humanities, we switched very quickly to move to virtual programming. Now that for us means that although we were coming up on a 10 year anniversary of the Cultural Center, right, July 24th of 2020, we weren't able to do that in person. So we had to come up with the next best thing. We, and we ended up creating a video at the 10 year anniversary. I will say that the most positive aspect out of that was people were able to join into our celebration who would not have been able to do that here in person. They would not have been able to travel. And we had a lot of friends from around the world, if you will, who joined us to watch the celebration and who also sent in special messages about their experience and their partnership or their time with the Chickasaw Cultural Center and of course the Chickasaw people. And to me, that was one of the most beautiful pieces of that video was hearing how other people feel about the cultural center. Because I can tell you all day long how wonderful and beautiful this place is, but to hear it through someone else's voice is truly amazing and how much it has touched other people as well. So we certainly invite you to watch that. That is still online at our Chickasaw Cultural Center Facebook page. But along with that, that was not the only virtual programming that we created. We also moved to workshops, Facebook videos, uh, classes that we were able to continue to teach our traditions through this virtual format, right? Through this virtual programming. It allowed us to stay connected. And in some ways it actually allowed us to connect with more Chickasaw people, people who were not able to travel to Oklahoma for a visit to the cultural center or our annual meeting and festival, whatever it may be. So we all very quickly managed to create virtual programming that allowed us to continue to share in the important aspects of our history and culture. And of course, you guys can see the, um, the addresses here. So I certainly invite you to click onto some of our stuff when you get an opportunity and please check all of that out. To talk about the Cultural Center, I first want to start 
with describing the logo. When we talk about the big overall campus, if you will, the logo is something that is very near and dear to us as it is made up of three ancient Southeastern symbols. The first is the spiral, which symbolizes wind and depicts life's journey from rebirth to afterlife. The second is the sacred eye, representing what we call Abba Benili, the one who sits above God or the creator. And then the third is the sun symbol, which is, I'm sorry, which signifies rebirth or renewal. And once we were able to put all those three together, they just made a beautiful logo for our Chickasaw Cultural Center. In talking about the campus features, I'll first let you know that if you haven't been to the Cultural Center, we certainly invite you once we are open to the public again. But whenever you do come, I hope that you have an experience that really starts from the entrance into the driveway because this facility is, is not one standalone building. It is actually comprised of several buildings and several outdoor spaces. And our goal is to really make you feel like you're involved in Chickasaw history and culture just as soon as you enter this campus. So you'll actually see that from the rondelles on our, our entryway to the Chickasaw language on our stop signs to the beautiful landscaping, which is native to Oklahoma, as well as Mississippi, our homeland. And so our goal is to invite you into this, this place, this home that we have, and hope that you truly immerse yourself in the Chickasaw culture. Now we do set on 184 acres, and we total 118,000 square feet of buildings. That is made up of five large indoor buildings. And then of course we have five outdoor facilities, areas as well too that everyone can enjoy. Here's a campus map. I'm not sure how well it shows up on your screen, but that will kind of give you just a, a rough idea, if you will, about the size of the campus. So let's start with the Achumpa gift shop. Achumpa actually means a place to buy in our language. And the gift shop was really designed as not only a gift shop, right? It was designed to be an avenue for Chickasaw artists. So we do sell Chickasaw artwork in there as well, handmade items from our various artists. But we also sell items that you know, you'll find in your souvenir type shops and museums. So we sell t-shirts and, and um, just various items like that, cups, mugs, postcards, etc. But I think the important part of that is it, it was designed to serve as another purpose. It was designed to serve as an artist for our avenue. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> an avenue for our artists. The next facility that I want to talk about is the HALISO. It's the Center for Study of Chickasaw History and Culture. Now this facility was very much built to be a protective facility, right? Protect our archival documents, our artifacts, our artwork. It's very much a state-of-the-art facility in the sense that controlled, climate controlled, light controlled, humidity controlled, all of that. That is the basement part where we house our archival documents. The top part of it, which is also controlled very much, is a wonderful library. It's a non-circulating library that we have here. It's a location where people are able to come in and conduct research, conduct genealogy, which is our most popular if you will, of the research here at the Cultural Center. And we have genealogists on staff that allow people to come in and talk to them and try to figure out, you know, if they have native ancestry for the five civilized tribes, we're able to connect back to the Dodge Rolls. And then of course, if they think they may be of another tribe, then we always try to connect with other 
uh, tribal operations as well too, so that people aren't just kind of left empty handed. So they're able to find a way to continue on with their search. So this facility has been used to house lectures. We've had conferences, workshops, um, all kinds of book signings. It's just a wonderful facility um, that's used for genealogy and research. This next area is an outdoor space. These are two different outdoor spaces. Excuse me. Two different outdoor spaces that we have here at the Cultural Center. One is the Honor Garden, and as you see, it features laser cut photos of all the Chickasaw Hall of Fame inductees. The Chickasaw Hall of Fame is a, a wonderful, a wonderful avenue for us to celebrate our Chickasaw people who have been very instrumental, whether it's carrying on culture, um, working through business opportunities, just supporting their community, their Chickasaw community and the community that they live in. So it's a beautiful place. It's a very reflective and kind of calming place as well too, to spend some time and, and look at some of the amazing folks that we have within the Chickasaw Nation. The next is the Water Pavilion and it's located across from the Honor Garden. Now the Water Pavilion about, oh gosh, three years ago, I guess, we decided to increase this, increase this area, if you will. So we added some, um, we added some items. One is a huge turtle and one is a fish that we have there, just kind of as a, a, a fun portion to this so that kids can see these up close and take pictures with them. And then we've also added a lot of panels. And on the panels at this water pavilion, it discusses the importance of water, what, what water means to us and has always meant to us as Chickasaw people. And I know as native people in general, you all understand the importance. So it allows us to give tribute to honor and to the animals within the water that are located in ponds and streams and lakes and it talks about how historically maybe we have used animals as well too if you will um, for for wonderful purposes and for purposes that meant a lot in our traditions so let's move on to the anoli theater whoops the anoli theater this is a very very large theater. It is um, 2,400 square feet. The screen alone is actually, so it's very large. We can see 350 people in there. And we have had a wonderful time with this particular facility as we are able to host film festivals and lectures. We've done fashion shows, cultural classes. So it's been a very diverse facility that we're able to showcase history and culture through. And not only art history and culture, for example, film festivals, we're able to showcase just native film fest, native films with native um, filmmakers. And they usually come in and then they have conversations with the audience. We do question and answer uh, sessions and just have a wonderful time. So it's really a place where we're able to uplift a lot of folks through Native Film. Iampa Cafe. Iampa means a place to eat in our Chickasaw language. And of course, this portion, as you can imagine, is very popular when our facility is open because it's a way for our visitors to experience another part of our tradition, right? It's a way for people to experience our food. And here every day we serve grape dumplings, which is a traditional dessert for us. And we show, we serve pashopa, which is a traditional soup type dish for us. We also have some of the more popular like fry bread and Indian tacos. And then just American Fair hamburgers, um, sandwiches, different things like that. But I know that that is very much a popular spot on campus. The biggest building that you will see when you're here at the Cultural Center is Chikasha Poya Exhibit Center. Now Chikasha Poya means we are Chickasaw. 
And this particular building really is the, the museum portion, if you will. This is where the permanent exhibits are housed. And within this building, you actually go through a chronological timeline of Chickasaw people from ancient times to present day. And this is gonna tell you the story of our homeland. It's gonna tell you the story of removal. Um, and it's gonna continue on to move you all the way through as to where we are as Chickasaw people today. Here's just a few pictures within the Chickasha Foya Exhibit Center. Um, so I will let y'all look at those for just a moment, whoops. Oh, sorry, I lost my little. My controls here. Let me go back like that. Okay, so back to this. Here's a couple of photos of the Chikasha Poya Exhibit Center. Okay, inside the Chikasha Poya is this area called the Spirit Forest. Now this is one of the most popular areas within our campus. And this really kind of depicts the most ancient sense of ourselves um, throughout this spirit forest. You're really transformed into a forest, right? Transported into a forest, I should say. So it really gives you the sounds and the lighting and the spirit of what it is to be in a forest. And within this area, we actually have some of our clan animals in there. And the clan animals, as you walk by, they will talk to you and they will tell you their name and they'll tell you, you know, the relationship to Chickasaw people. So it's, it's an amazing place for people to, to really look back, if you will, to really kind of feel that ancient history of who we are as Chickasaw people. As you continue through the Chikasha Poya, you're going to come into the Stomp Dance Gallery. Now, this is a very unique experience for people because they're able to join in a stomp dance, if you will, uh, through the, this, this particular exhibit. We do have visitors and, of course, children's groups, educational groups who come in, and the way that this exhibit is set up, you enter into one side, and then you're able to dance around the fire and you exit out. So it gives people a little bit of a sense of being in a stomp dance. Now we'll move to the Chikasha and Chuka village. Now we did actually build a replica of a traditional village set in 1700s to 1750s. In this village, you're going to find a large council house, two summer homes, two winter homes, a corn crib, a replica mound, a stickball field, and then a spiral garden inside this facility or this location. But surrounding all of this is a palisade fence. The wonderful part of the village is it allows visitors to, to see what a village was like, right, in 1700s. So people are able to come into these homes. They're able to see what items are in the homes year round. And of course, we have added audio into these facilities too. So they're able to hear what these are made of or how they were used, um, what times of year they might've been used more so than others. So it, it, is, a, it is an opportunity for visitors visitors to see what an ancient village looks like. Now, when the weather is beautiful, we are able to have wonderful demonstrations out there um, from storytelling to language classes, lots of cooking outdoors. And this is a location where we have several of our festivals when we're able to, um, depending on the weather but we usually celebrate a Three Sisters in the spring. We do wonderful fall festivals. Um, and throughout the year, throughout the summer as well too, we're able to use this facility to do many, many outdoor demonstrations. 
the spiral garden in Encana Bridge. Now beyond the Palisade fence, we have um, a beautiful spiral garden. And in this, we are able to plant all kinds of items, you know, from corn, beans, and squash to any kind of herbs, tomatoes, et cetera. And a lot of that we're able to use within our Iampa Cafe for very fresh ingredients. Beside the spiral garden or located close to is the Encana Bridge. And this bridge is a 195 foot pedestrian bridge. This is actually a partnership between the Chickasaw National Recreation Area, which is a national park, and the Chickasaw Cultural Center. So it allows us to connect with our neighbors because we actually are like right up against the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. So it allows us and allows our visitors to visit both locations, right? They cross the bridge and are able to visit both locations. The Aya Sacha building is a building that we recently built about three years ago. And we did this because our collections were becoming very large. I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, we had the Holisso. Well, if you notice, I talked a lot about it being genealogy and archival. That's because once we, we knew our collection was growing and would continue to grow, and knew there was a need for another building, we decided to build Ayasachi. And as you see, it means a place to store. But we were able to then split our collection and move our archaeology, our artifacts, our artwork, our 3D objects over to this facility um, and have it be housed in this new facility. And then, of course, have the Feliso remain for our archival documents and for our genealogy records and as a research facility. That's really my time in my presentation. Again, I wanna say thank you for having me for this uh, wonderful conversation. I appreciate what IENTA has done to help boost tourism in, um, in Chickasaw country and throughout all native country. So thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for that wonderful presentation. And at this time, um, I want to introduce Kay Anderson. She is the Director of Public Relations for the Agua Caliente Band of Cohia Indians. And um, she is an enrolled tribal member of Citizen Potawatomi Nation, a federally recognized tribe with a reservation in Shawnee, Oklahoma. She has three decades of experience in journalism, photography, public relations, marketing, and film. As the Director of Public Relations, Kate leads a team respons responsible for developing communication, educational and outreach programs to help advance community knowledge and understanding of the Agua Caliente Band of Cujia Indians and its efforts. Kate also operates the Agua Caliente Film Office and serves as the liaison to all filmmakers and photographers working on the Agua Caliente Indian Reservation. The Agua Caliente Indian Reservation covers about 31,500 acres across four jurisdictions, including the cities of Palm Springs, Cathedral City, Rancho Mirage, and unincorporated areas of Riverside County. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kate, and I know that Kate has some poll questions for you. So we're going to go ahead and bring that up. Um, I know that we're a little bit over our time, but please you're more than welcome to stay. And if you can't, um, we will send out the recording. Um, let me go ahead and pull up those poll questions for you. And I'm gonna launch them right now. So please take a few seconds to answer Kate's poll questions. Number one, how likely are you to visit Southern California for vacation in the next year? Very likely, somewhat likely, not likely. Two, how likely will you visit a Native American culture center on your next visit? Three, what entry fee would you pay to visit a Native American cultural center? Four, what are you interested in most from the list below? Native American garden, history, to traditions, culture, or modern day life? Um, and then number five, how much would you likely spend at a Native American gift shop? So we'll go ahead and give it a few seconds and then I will hand this over to Kate. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling right now. And I will share the results. 
so 40% said not likely that you will not visit Southern California, and I'm sure it's due to the pandemic. Number two, very likely um, that you'll visit a Native American cultural center on your next visit. 58% uh, answered with um, what entry fee they would pay, which is $10 or more. And then 78% uh, are interested in the Native American history, traditions, and culture. And how much would you likely spend in a uh, Native American gift shop? 67% uh, came in at 50 to 100. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will hand it over to you, Kate. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. And thank you to Ayanta, Bianca, Sherry, and my fo uh, fellow co presenters. Everybody is uh, providing such great information, and I've been taking notes along the way. Um, just with their sentiments, our new cultural plaza is very much a place for gathering for our tribal people. And first and foremost, it's for the tribe, by the tribe and of the tribe, which is an incredible movement that's happening across the United States and into Alaska and Hawaii. I think having these centers for our own people is such an important role that we play as tribal governments and tribal organizations so that we can continue to share and, and keep the culture for our people. So uh, with that said, the Agua Caliente Band of Cui Indians uh, have been wanting to build a, a museum, um, a new museum for the tribe for over 20 years. We did enjoy a very, very small space of a museum in downtown Palm Springs for a very long time. But a few years ago, the tribe had the opportunity to redevelop a very large parcel of land. It's a full square block in downtown Palm Springs. And uh, a lot of, of ideas and um, a lot of uh, work went into what we were going to, what were we going to build there? And of course, first and foremost on the tribe's uh, palette was a cultural plaza. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you what the vision is. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it's going to include. Uh, we would have been open by now, but of course the COVID pandemic has uh, put a stop to our construction. We were about 80% done with our construction when COVID hit. So we did go on pause, we suspended construction, and we're just now looking forward to re-engaging this spring uh, and starting the project up again. And so about a year from now, this time next year, we should be up and running fully. So I'll invite you all back to Southern California, to Palm Springs, to come to our cultural plaza. So here we go. Uh, Bianca, is the sound playing? I can't hear it from my side. Yes, I can hear it. Okay. All right, so it looks like we're having a little trouble with tech technology, that's okay. Uh, that just gives you a sneak preview of what our cultural plaza is, is starting to shape up as. And uh, the sounds that you heard, the music that you're hearing is the Agua Caliente bird singers. And so here in Southern California and some parts of the Southwest, uh, dancers uh, dance to the beat of the gourd rattle versus the to the beat of the drum. So our bird singers and dancers are a very important part of our new cultural plaza. All right, and here we have a site map. So as I mentioned, this is an entire city block in downtown Palm Springs. And our reservation is unique in that we are considered an urban tribe. Uh, I know that Palm Springs doesn't sound very urban. It's not uh, a metropolitan area like LA or that sort of thing, but we, our reservation is interwoven with the community. And we actually, uh, we have three uh, local jurisdictions that cross over the reservation. And so really we are interwoven into the community and vice versa. So having a whole city block dedicated to the tribe's culture is going to be a huge transformation in downtown Palm Springs. And so on the left-hand side here, we have the brand new museum. It will be 
be an incredible facility for the tribe, the community, and travelers from around the world. We also have a uh, spa, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why we have a spa on that site. Uh, this is the home of the Agua Caliente Hot Mineral Spring, which is one of the most sacred sites on the reservation. And so that's a very, very important part of this development and an important part of the tribe. And in fact, this site is the site of the origination of the creation story of the Agua Caliente people. And so one of the very, very first exhibits that guests will see when they come into our new museum is a 360 uh, video panel of uh, the creation story. So an animation of the creation story. Uh, then we, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the site itself. We're creating a central gathering point for the community, for visitors. Uh, a lot of people like to walk around downtown Palm Springs when they visit this area. And we know that our cultural plaza with its beautiful outdoor spaces and walkways will become a very important gathering space for downtown Palm Springs, as well as for our tribal members and guests. Uh, the Cultural Museum itself is very similar to what you've already heard today. This is a place for keeping of the culture, sharing the history, the traditions, um, and as well as that, just being a place for school children to come and visit and learn about the tribe. So this really is our teaching center uh, for our tribal members and for guests and visitors. Um, we have a lot of interactive uh, high tech exhibits, as well as many, many artifacts will be on display here. In addition, we've got our gathering plaza. The gathering plaza is a really important part of our whole experience. We wanted to, just like a theater in some of the other um, facilities, we have a gathering plaza. It's beautiful in Palm Springs, 300 days a year. We have sunshine and beautiful weather. And so we know that this outdoor space will be a very, very important place for us to program throughout the year. In addition, we have an oasis trail that runs through the center of the plaza area. Uh, this is, is meant to be a place for um, really just finding your peaceful um, and you know, really finding peace and um, experiencing what would be the outdoor areas of Andreas Canyon, the Indian Canyons, Taquitz Canyon, which are all ancestral areas that are uh, in and among Palm Springs that are open by the tribe. Uh, we operate these areas for recreational purposes, but for those who cannot make it out to hike in our ancestral areas, we are recreating that in downtown Palm Springs. We do think that that will also inspire visitors to also participate in our outdoor recreation areas as well, which are just a short five to 10 minute drive from this particular location. Uh, in addition, uh, we do have a spa on the site. The importance of the spa is to celebrate Seke. Seke is the Agua Caliente hot spring, which bubbles up in the downtown area of Palm Springs right on this site. And so at the spa, visitors and guests will be able to enjoy the health benefits of Seke and the healing waters of Seke. Uh, the water that uh, comes up in downtown Palm Springs here is uh, carbon dated at about 12,000 years which means that this water has not seen the Earth's surface since the, the end of the last ice age. So this is very, very special water. And this has been a very, very special uh, area for the tribe for many, many generations. And uh, in fact, um, as we were preparing the site for redevelopment, we opened up the spa, we opened up the site of the spring. Uh, it was capped in the 1950s during a road widening and future development. Um, and so we, we wanted to make sure that we re reinvested in the structural integrity of the spring. This water comes directly out of the ground from a cavern about a mile and a half down into to the Earth's surface, and this is a unique waterway. Uh, it does not intersect with the aquifer of the valley, which is uh, our drinking water supply, but truly does bubble up from uh, its very own special cavern about a mile and a half down the Earth's surface. So the Agua Caliente Cultural Spring was re- um, uh, 
we, we established a new ring around the spring and it is once again covered up, unfortunately, but we did make this major investment in this structural integrity of the spring so that the spring water could be saved for generations to come. This is actually a picture. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of the Agua Caliente Hot Mineral Spring. This is Seque. And uh, this is the first bathhouse that existed at Seque in the 1880s. And this is really what became the very, very first tourist attraction in Palm Springs. Um, as visitors began, non-Indian visitors began to travel through Palm Springs, uh, the Agua Caliente people shared the healing benefits of the spring with visitors. And this was the, the first bathhouse that was built at the spring. You can see at that time, the spring was a free flowing spring and you could literally walk upon uh, the oasis of the spring. And then eventually the bathhouse was created as a, a uh, business. So you could come to the spring, you could sit in the healing waters, uh, stick your feet in the sand and really enjoy the benefits of those healing waters as early as the late 1880s. And there was a small fee attached to coming to the spring and sitting in the bathhouse. Uh, as the bathhouse got, became more and more popular, uh, so did the construction of the spring evolve. And um, the bathhouses then became uh, more of a tourist attraction and uh, the tribe began to share with more and more people. So here you see the bathhouse in the 19, early 1900s. And then of course, uh, in the 1930s, this is really when Hollywood arrived in Palm Springs and more and more visitors from LA were coming over to Palm Springs. And this was really the beginning of the emerging boom of Palm Springs. Palm Springs is, is named after the Agua Caliente Hot Spring and the Washingtonia filipper palm trees that are the only native palm tree to the Palm Springs area. So thus Palm Springs is named for everything that the tribe embraces in its culture. So again, 1930s, Agua Caliente mineral baths, very, very important part of our history here and the evolution of tourism in Palm Springs. So the tribe was at the uh, foremost first um, part of the tourist attractions of Palm Springs. And then in the 1960s, the um, all women tribal, in the 1950s, uh, you may or may not know the story, but the all women tribal council from Agua Caliente basically uh, lobbied Washington DC and got Congress to change the leasing laws of Indian land. And uh, the 99 year land leases were approved by Congress. And so in the 1960s, the next generation bathhouse was built and in 1963 opened as the world's most beautiful spa. And so the tribe has been sharing this healing water ever since the late 1800s into the 1960s. And now we're getting ready to open the next generation bathhouse with the, with the spa at Sehi. And we're very, very excited about that. Now, something very, very important happened along the way of the construction of the Agua Caliente Cultural Plaza. Um, as expected, we ran into some very, very important archaeology along the way. Uh, we have cultural monitors here that monitor all major construction projects. And anytime we're digging in the ground, our cultural monitors are present. So a couple of years ago in 2018, when we were beginning construction, our cultural monitors found some very, very important features in the ground. And in fact, those first features they found were hearth features. So for any of you who knows your archaeology, hearth features are remnants of human habitation and fire. So what we did is we ultimately stopped construction for about six months. We did a full scale um, archaeological recovery and excavation of the site. We have thousands of items that were recovered from that very, very important recovery. And in fact, uh, before this recovery, the latest science, the most important science that we had about the human habitation here in the Palm Springs area dated about 4,000 years. And um, because we knew that this site at Seque was very, very important, uh, the carbon dated testing of the items that were recovered from the 2018 archaeological recovery, in fact, blew all that we knew scientifically out of the water. And uh, 
we do have items that have come back at 8,000 years and 9,000 years. And so the importance of that um, to Native American culture is that we really looked at this as a recovery for the tribe, by the tribe, and of the tribe. So we were working with uh, in in the makeup of indigenous archaeology. So this was archaeology that was going to be important to the tribe and telling the tribe's story. And in fact, this archaeology supports all of the oral history that has been passed down by the tribe. And why that's important is because um, westernized civilization needs scientific evidence where we as native people, we know that our oral traditions are so important to the history and the storytelling of our tribe, but this scientific evidence is important to the Western culture. And so to be able to show Western culture and people around the world that we have um, archaeology that dates back 8,000, 9,000 years is very important for us to be able to tell our story that we have been here, the Agua Caliente people have been here since time immemorial. And in fact, because this is such important information, it is becoming one of our exhibits that will be in the museum. So the very, very last exhibit that you go through uh, in the museum before you get to the gift shop is the archaeological recovery of the site. Um, it took six months to comb through basically every inch of the site and to uh, really benefit the, uh, you know, really enjoy the benefits of the archaeology of this site. So that became a really important piece of our story. It became a piece of the story of the museum. And we're very excited to share this around the world. We've just now been uh, revealing this story. And in fact, we're writing a book that will be available in the museum uh, gift shop as well. One of the things I wanted to talk about is through this pandemic, uh, we did not have a project to share with the community. We suspended construction. But one of the things that's been really important for us to keep people engaged, we want to make sure that we kept uh, our work at creating our ambassadors around our community. We have a lot of great partners around the community that are very excited for our, our cultural plaza to open. Uh, we have our uh, tourism operators and our Convention and Vir Visitors Bureau. Um, our Main Street downtown merchants are involved. We have a partnership with the Palm Springs Art Museum. We have four uh, Chamber of Commerce that we partner with and we have nine cities. And so we've been working with all of those partners to continue to make sure that when our cultural plaza opens, we have a lot of excitement and a lot of support from our surrounding community to make sure that we're successful in the cultural tourism market. We also have our other tribal enterprises that we've been operating throughout the pandemic. Those become important voices for us as we get ready to open our cultural plaza. I think Chickasaw uh, shows how important some of those other enterprises can be to cultural tourism. So those are our uh, tribal enterprises that are very, very important as we open up our cultural plaza as well. And then like the others, we have programs that exist with and among the new cultural plaza the museum and the spa. We have our curriculum project that we do with our local schools. We actually have curriculum that has been mandated uh, about the history and the modern times of the Agua Caliente people that are taught in the third grade, the eighth grade, and the 11th grade within the Palm Springs School District. And so we'll continue that work with the curriculum. That'll become an important part of bringing field trips into the museum and the cultural plaza. And then we also have an Agua Caliente Junior Ranger program where we bring school children out to the Indian canyons for field trips. That will also be a continuing important part of how we partner up with the museum. Um, we bring thousands of school children to the canyons each year on those field trips. Uh, telling our stories has been very important during this construction suspension. We're continuing to use all of our multimedia, web, social media, YouTube, working on editorial coverage, as well as, of course, marketing and advertising. But we, we continue to tell our stories, even though we're closed and we're going through COVID, and we're really looking forward to the opportunities to engage all of those avenues when we begin construction again. And then of course, when we are uh, anticipating our opening. One of the great things that we have here in Palm Springs 
is we are a destination within a destination. And we have that bullet point there. Uh, we're missing one important number there. And I wanted to really make sure that I emphasize that. We have more than 2.3 million people who visit Palm Springs each and every year for sun, recreation, and relaxation. So those 2.3 million people become our potential audience. Uh, our new cultural plaza is located five minutes away drive time from the international airport here in Palm Springs. So we know that that hub is very, very important for us to be able to capture those visitors and invite them to come and experience the Agua Caliente history, culture and traditions. So with that, uh, we've been keeping people engaged with a um, Vision Agua Caliente website where we actually take live video uh, and post it 360 on our website, visionaguacaliente.com. And you can go to this website and see our progress of our cultural plaza as we go along. And this is just a quick demonstration on how that website works and the type of imagery we have been posting to the website to ensure that people uh, are seeing the progress of our work. It's been a long time uh, through this construction period. The COVID is, um, is adding more than a year to our construction cycle. And so we want to make sure that people can stay engaged with our process. They can see the reality of the construction and that, that, that this is going to be realized uh, very, very soon. So I'm looking forward to being able to uh, share the new opening date. Hopefully I'll have a new date this spring and we'll be able to um, look forward to the opening of the new cultural plaza. And so at this point in time, I just want to say we hope that we see you all soon. I am, I am pretty sure that we'll be open and running in a year from now. Vision Agua Caliente allows you to keep up with our progress on our construction and working toward our opening. And I just want to invite any and all of you, if you have questions, comments, anything that you'd like to share, please reach out to me anytime. And I just want to thank you all for tuning in today. Thanks for being here. And thanks to Ayanta for the opportunity. Thank you, Kate. How exciting. I can't wait to visit once it's open, especially the spa at second. That sounds very, very relaxing. So thank you all for staying with us. Um, our time is up. I believe all the questions, well, most of the questions have been answered in the Q&A and then the chat box. And if not, we will send those questions to our presenters and they will be in contact with you. Just wanting to let you know that we will be posting this webinar on the Ayanta website and we'll send a link to your email addresses. Um, please follow us at ayanta.org slash webinar for future webinars hosted by Ayanta. If you are not a member of Ayanta and would like to be, please contact Gail Shehak. She is our tribal relations and outreach manager. And I believe Sherry Bowman has entered her email address on the website. Again, thank you, Valerie, Emily, and Kate for your time this morning. And we appreciate all of you attendees for being here and have a great day. Thank you.